Hey guys, Will here. Now today is a very significant day, both for me personally, as well as for a lot of motorsport fans all around the world. And I really wanted to take some time today just to acknowledge this moment in history because this is a very significant day. Today is the 25th or the quarter century anniversary of the death of arguably one of the greatest racing drivers of all time and unequivocally one of the greatest motorsport or indeed international sporting icons of all time. So today, the 1st of May 2019 marks the 25th anniversary, believe it or not. And I can still remember the day that this happened like it was just yesterday, even though I was only nine years old at the time. So today is the 25th anniversary of the death of Ayrton Senna. So I wanted to, in this video, basically just sort of talk about why I am such a massive Ayrton Senna fan myself. Now, I know that this is probably going to be a little bit weird for some people who may not have been around when Ayrton Senna was winning championships and capturing the imagination of, you know, children all around the world. Um, you know, it's, I'm getting emotional just thinking about it, but, you know, I, I grew up watching Ayrton Senna winning championships. You know, he was a childhood idol of mine. Um, you know, and that was the case for many different reasons, primarily just because he was so incredibly good at what he did. He was one of those amazing drivers that was able to just extract that little bit more out of out of the car that he was driving. And it was just incredible to watch back then. You know, those were the golden days of motorsport, in my opinion. Obviously, we have some incredible driving now, but particularly in Formula One, it's so political these days. And it was political back then as well. But you know, there's so much manufactured racing these days in terms of, you know, you've got things like DRS, ERS, you know, all these things that are designed to make the racing more interesting, but make it that little bit less raw than it used to be back in, I guess, the golden days of motorsport. So before we take a closer look at the character of Ayrton Senna and why I am such a massive fan myself and why so significant to me personally, I wanted to quickly explain the circumstances surrounding exactly what happened on May 1st, 1994. So I know a lot of you guys that are watching this probably weren't born yet or, you know, may have a sketchy memory around exactly what happened. So the Imola 1994 race meet was the first time that a driver had passed away for quite a significant amount of time. In the years before that, when the technology and the safety was a lot weaker, you know, drivers dying in races was pretty commonplace. And to, to be honest with you guys, most of the time, the drivers went into it expecting that this could be the last time they would ever race. You know, they it was just assumed that you were in great danger and that, you know, th bad things could happen. And that was just a part of the sport. And there were some massive advances in safety. Now, we saw some absolutely horrific accidents leading up to, you know, this, this event. And there were some absolutely what would imagine to be unsurvivable accidents that took place. Martin Donnelly's accident comes to mind. Gerhard Berger's accident in exactly the same place as Senna's accident was another absolutely horrific one as well. And I think that... You know, people in general, and particularly the drivers, had actually developed quite a lot of complacency around safety in Formula One. Now, that's not to say that there was complacency from the FIA in terms of safety or anything like that. In fact, this was a, a massive time of innovation in Formula One because, you know, there, there, there were so many bad accidents in the past that had killed drivers. And suddenly we were in a position where we were seeing these absolutely horrendous accidents that seemed unsurvivable. And yet the drivers were getting out of their cars and walking away on what seemed like a regular basis. So this developed a bit of a complacency, you know, for spectators as well as the drivers themselves to an extent. Now, the first accident that took place was Rubens Barrichello on the Friday practice sessions. And I'll show you that accident now so you can see just how horrible that accident was. <laughs>
Now, incredibly, although he wasn't able to walk away from the accident, he did survive the accident and he went on to race for many, many years to come. In fact, he only retired what seems like a couple of years ago now. So, you know, incredible that he was able to survive that accident. But unfortunately, the very next day, Roland Ratzenberger, during qualifying, had another absolutely horrible accident and passed away. So... This was the first death that had taken place in Formula 1 for a number of years, and this was a real reality check for all of the drivers. Now, I'll show you the accident on the screen now quickly, and I will warn you that this is extremely graphic. You're witnessing somebody passing away, basically. So I just want to you know, prepare you for that. If you haven't seen this before, it is very, very confronting footage. So we'll watch it quickly now. Skip over the next couple of seconds if you don't want to see this. <laughs> So as a nine-year-old boy, I actually saw this happen live on television and it really, really deeply affected me. You know, seeing a driver slumped in the car like that, you know, taking their last breaths and watching the medics, you know, working frantically beside him. I didn't show it in the footage here, but they actually broadcast live, you know, Sid Watkins, the, the surgeon, you know, they pulled him out of the car, they had him laying beside the track and he was doing CPR on him and you, you could just tell that there was something absolutely horrific going on. And that was broadcast live around the world. And that was, you know, that deeply affected me. But it also very, very deeply affected all the drivers as well. And if you've seen the Senna documentary, you would have seen the footage of Senna actually himself seeing, seeing the footage. And he actually went to the scene of the accident to, you know, just, just to be there and to, I guess, witness what was going on. And we, we, we've never seen an interview with him because obviously he passed away the next day. So we don't know exactly what was going through his mind when that happened. But we do know that it affected him extremely deeply. We know that he had a conversation with Sid Watkins that night, I believe it was, basically saying, you know, why... Sid Watkins said to him, why don't we just retire? Why don't we just go and play golf together? You know, we don't need this. This is, this is too much. And, you know, Senna's answer to that was, you know, this is, this is what I do. This is what I'm about. This is my life. And, you know, I can't. I, I, I have to keep going. And... You know, that's, I guess, the first little bit of insight into Senna as a, as a character in this video. But we'll, we'll touch on that again a little bit later. But So following the death of Roland Ratzenberger on the Saturday practice, there was already a, you know, absolutely horrible energy hovering around the circuit. And a lot of the drivers, you know, were questioning whether they were even going to start the race. And then we had another absolutely horrible accident at the start of the race uh, where Pedro Lamy had an incident and parts of his car went flying into the pit lane, injured a mechanic, injured some people in the crowd as well, I believe. And um, that triggered a restart of the race, which a lot of people would argue was actually what contributed to Ayrton Senna's, or what actually caused Ayrton Senna's accident. And again, we'll touch on that a little bit later, but basically the race was restarted. Ayrton Senna went round one lap in close pursuit by Michael Schumacher, who was in second place. And um, Senna had actually managed to put his car on pole position, which was pretty incredible considering what was going on at the time. There were a lot of problems around the Williams not being as competitive as it had been in previous years. And there was also speculation that Michael Schumacher was cheating as well and had active suspension still running in his car. So there was a lot of politics around that as well. And Ayrton Senna wasn't in a good mind space Generally speaking, he was quite disturbed. He genuinely believed that uh, Michael Schumacher and the Benetton team were cheating and the odds were against him. He hadn't had a good start to the season whatsoever. So his mind was not in a good place. But no nonetheless, he'd managed to put his car on pole position, started the race from the beginning, was in the lead. They had the restart. Michael Schumacher was in close pursuit. And on the second lap after the restart, you see coming around Tamburello turn, which was you know one of the scariest turns in motorsport at the time, absolutely flat out around this turn. But it was a turn where, you know, unless something went wrong with the car, basically, there was no way you would have an accident. So you see from Michael Schumacher's car, Ayrton Senna is, you know, he starts to turn in and then his car just continues straight on, straight into the wall. And, you know, he hits the wall at over 300 kilometers an hour. It doesn't even seem like he attempts to slow down. And bits of the car go flying everywhere. The car skids across the track comes to a rest, and again, we're faced with that absolutely horrible scene of a racing driver slumped over in the car 
once again for the second time in two days. So I will show you the footage of the accident quickly now from a couple of different angles. And again, if you if you don't want to see this, just just click away for a moment. You know, click away. You can listen to the sound, or you can skip forward a minute or so. But I do think that it's important to you know to watch this if you've got the stomach for it, simply because it is significant. It really does give you insight into you know just just how powerful this was as a moment in history. So I'm going to roll that footage now so you can see it for yourself. They were so far off in the warm up, but he is really not losing much for center at all. And I would say basically he's right with him. Well, we're, we are right with Michael Schumacher now. And Senna, my goodness, I just saw him plunge off to the right and Senna has joined Pedro Lamy and JJ Letter in a shattered motor car. You can see the debris on the right. What on earth happened there? I don't know whether it was a sudden loss of downforce for some reason, but Senna is still in the car. It means to say, of course, that Schumacher has gone into the lead, but the important thing is now, how is Ayrton Senna, with the marshals already waving the yellow flags? No passing. Yes, this looks very severe indeed, I must say. It looks like uh, this, this corner that Senna was going around is absolutely flat out. It's 185 miles an hour. We really should be seeing some medical attention coming quickly here to the Williams with Senna. His head is uh, he's very still in that car. Uh, the car has clearly gone straight on. This is a little bit like the accident that beset. He, is, he really needs help in that car. There is nobody coming to him at the moment. Yes, his head moved. I think I just saw his head move a little bit then. The race has been stopped. The red flag is out. This looks a little bit like a, uh, a problem with the car, as beset Berger at this very point four years ago in his Ferrari. And it's where Nelson Piquet went off in the Williams some years ago in similar circumstances, and uh, thank heavens he was, uh, was all right. I must, I must say I have concern at the fact that A, Senna is sitting in the car still, not moving, and, and B, uh, surprisingly, there is not a lot of action, and here it is. Now look. He's going into the left hander tremendously fast, and he runs wide and goes okay, straight off. Doesn't even attempt to take the corner. And, uh, well, I say that's about 190 miles an hour at that point, the exit from the Tamburello. They're still building up speed, but uh, it was not short, not very far short of 200 miles an hour. You can see the debris pouring off the car as Gerhard Berger comes through in the Ferrari. Yes, it was and already the point where I think Gerhard Berger went off, John, a couple of years ago. Berger went off, and well, we don't know the circumstances of Senna's accident at this point, but certainly when Berger went off, he hit the wall very, very hard. I think, in fact, it was maybe a little earlier in the corner, but nonetheless, this Tamburello corner, it is flat out. It's 190 miles an hour, and if you have a problem there and go off on the outside of the circuit, there are those retaining walls, but they're hard, they are concrete, and you saw how unyielding the impact was. But the car bounced off and a lot of energy was dissipated in the first contact. Now, I've seen that footage hundreds of times now over the years. I, 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 I almost have like a, a, a sick fascination with watching it because it's, there's, there's so much mystique around exactly what happened. There's so much speculation around what actually caused the accident. We'll talk about that in a little bit. But just the, you know, the significance of what that moment was, you know, that was a, a national icon, an absolute hero to the Brazilian people and a hero to people all around the world losing his life. And for some reason, that, that bit of footage just fascinates me. And I, I, I can't explain exactly why that is, but, you know, I've watched it so many times, hundreds of times trying to, you know, maybe see something that I hadn't seen before or I guess, you know, this, I just have this deep desire to understand exactly what happened. So again, we see a driver slumped over in the cockpit of a car. We do actually see a little bit of movement there for a moment, which gives the commentators, and you hear Murray Walker in the footage, uh, you know, express that, you know, maybe he's okay because you see a little bit of head movement there, but then he slumps over again, and that's the last time that we see him move. It takes an extremely long time for the, um, for the, for the doctors to get to him and extract him from the car. And again, we're faced with a live television scene of, I think it was almost, I think it was almost 20 minutes of you know helicopter circling watching you know them frantically working on him you see a pool of blood starting to form beside the beside the circuit and Sid Watkins working frantically on him and you know Sid Watkins later on in interviews has expressed that you know even though he wasn't a religious person you know he witnessed Ayrton Senna take his last breath and felt that his soul had departed 
during that last breath, which, you know, is an incredibly powerful thing. And they took him away in the helicopter and within an hour were announcing during the live broadcast that that Senna had passed away. And, uh, you know, the race did continue and that was another contentious point as well. A lot of people believe that the race shouldn't have been continued uh, considering the horrible things that had taken place. Everybody just wanted it to stop. We just wanted the weekend to go away and, you know, never think about it again because it was just so horrible. Michael Schumacher ultimately went on to win the race and the world championship that year, dedicated it to, um, to Senna, of course. And you can, you can go through and watch all the footage of, you know, the press, the press conferences, the post race interviews and things like that. And I do encourage you to look at all of that stuff because it is very powerful stuff. But Basically, the world was faced with the reality that the, the, the greatest racing driver of all time, arguably, and definitely one of the, you know, the greatest motorsporting icons or sporting icons of all time had passed away. So I think the best way to express just how significant this moment in history was, was that not only was it declared a national day of mourning in Brazil, not only was it broadcast on national and international television live, three million people lined the streets for Ayrton Senna's funeral to watch him, you know, be transported through and his coffin be offloaded and taken into the church for the, for the funeral. Three million people. Just take a moment to think about that. Three million people showing up for a funeral of a racing driver. Do you think that that would happen today? I don't know. I, I honestly, I can't think of too many people in the world today that 3 million people would show up to their funeral. It's just incredible. So basically that at the time in Brazil, there wasn't a whole lot for people to be excited about. There was all sorts of things going on with, you know, famine and suffering, fighting. And, you know, the Brazilian people didn't have a whole lot to be proud of at that point in time. And so for a lot of people, Ayrton Senna was sort of like their knight in shining armor. Ayrton Senna was something that the Brazilian, that brought the people together, that made them proud to be Brazilian and at a time when they didn't have much else to be proud of. And I think that is part of the significance. And then there's also the incredible work that he was doing for, you know, he, he, had, his, he had his charity as well, the Ayrton Senna Institute. And, he, you know, he was, he was paying for children's education. He was trying to build a better country and he was just so deeply passionate about his people and wanting to make the world a better place for his people and that was part of the mystique around Ayrton Senna and what makes him such an interesting person is the fact that he was so absolutely incredibly ruthless on the track and a lot of people didn't like him a lot of people thought that he was you know this really horrible arrogant aggressive person and yet that was so so incredibly contrasted by his nature out off the racetrack. Um, you know, he was, he was always the guy that was fighting for extra safety. He was always the guy that was fighting for the voices of the drivers to be heard in the, you know, in the, in the pre-race briefings and stuff like that. He was always the guy that stood up for the driver's rights and stuff like that. So that's part of what makes him such an interesting character is the fact that there is just this stark contrast between, you know, his character on the racetrack versus his character everywhere else. So that hopefully gives you guys that might not be familiar with the story there a little bit more of an insight into Ayrton Senna as a racing driver and the, the events that took place 25 years ago. Now, I do encourage you to, um, to do, a, do, do your own research, so to speak. There's so much information out there around what happened and things like that. Now, there's also a lot of controversy as well around the accident. Basically... There were, two, there were two main theories. There was the theory that the, that the steering column broke, and that's what actually caused the accident. And then there was another theory, an alternate theory, which was that the tyre pressures basically dropped during the safety car period, so that when they had the rolling restart, the tyres um, the were so cold that the ride height was lower, and the car actually bottomed out when he was turning into Tamburello, and that's what caused the car to basically careen straight on at full speed into the into the wall at Tamburello. Now, what actually caused his death was that a, uh, a part of the steering arm actually flew up. It was compressed in the accident and flung up at just the right angle to actually pierce his helmet and um, do some do some massive internal damage to his to his brain, which basically ultimately caused his death. So it was one of those things where the accident may have even been survivable if he'd hit at a slightly different angle. And we'd seen accidents that looked 
you know, even though it was an absolutely horrible accident, we'd seen accidents that looked so much worse that, um, you know, that the driver had just gotten up and walked away from. So it was almost unbelievable watching it. If, and I think that if we hadn't had the death of Roland Ratzenberger the day before, people probably would have just expected that he'd get up and walk away. You know, people were just so thrown by the fact that this was happening. But um, yeah, there are a lot of different theories around exactly what caused the accident. And that's, um, that actually ended up going through the court system and it wasn't actually resolved until 2007. Now, ultimately, it was determined that the steering column had broken and that was what had caused the accident. There's still a lot of people that believe that to not be true. And there's a lot of very, I guess, mysterious circumstances around the accident. There's footage from the, from the cameras that mysteriously seems to have gone missing. There's data from the Black Rocks recorders that never was, never was presented. There was the fact that the black box recorders were actually removed by Williams from the car and um, supposedly tampered with before they were submitted to the, um, to the authorities to actually do the investigation, extract the data and figure out what happened on the car. So there were a lot of very strange circumstances around the accident, which ultimately resulted in a lot of conspiracy theories as well. Ultimately, Patrick Head was, um, was found to be responsible for the accident, being the designer of the vehicle and the person that had actually authorized the extension of the steering arm. The steering arm, the, the steering column had actually been extended to suit Ayrton Senna, and it was actually one of the welds on that extension that had cracked. And it's still not 100% clear whether that happened as a result of the accident or happened leading into the accident. There's been videos made by uh, David Coulthard sitting in a cockpit of, a, of one of these cars demonstrating how much the column bends in what they, what they determined was normal driving. Um, there's videos showing the steering column in the lead up to the accident and movement. There's tracking that you can watch. There's all sorts of videos that you can analyze. They're all available on YouTube and I'll provide some links in the description for you guys as well if you want to do any of your own study. But basically, yeah, there's the two theories that either the car bottomed out and went straight on or the steering column broke. Patrick Head was found responsible for the accident, but because of the laws surrounding this, you can't actually be charged with murder and uh, and convicted or convicted of murder more than seven years after an accident has occurred. And this obviously taking place a long time after that in 2007 when the accident occurred in, two, in um, 1994. He was never actually formally charged with the crime even though he was found guilty of it. So that is basically where things were left. Um, there, there has been calls for another for another inquest into it. There's been all sorts of books written about it. There's actually a really, really good private investigation that was done, a book called Tamborello, which I do recommend you guys purchase and read. I'll provide a link in the description below for you guys for that now. Not affiliated with the author in any way. I actually emailed him to say thank you for writing the book and never heard back, which I was a little bit disappointed about. But um, I do recommend that you guys read that book. It is a very, very interesting analysis of the accident. So now that we've discussed exactly what happened on this day 25 years ago and the global significance of that event, I wanted to talk a little bit more about why Ayrton Senna is such an important human being to me personally. So probably going to struggle to get through this without tearing up. But um, look, basically, I, I grew up and I grew up watching this guy. And you can see that, you know, I've got my Senna shirt. I've got my FW16 model, which I paid a lot more than I would care to admit for. There was only ever actually, I think it was 320 of these made with the official Rothmans livery. They actually changed the laws around that about, I think it was two months into production of this model. And this was, this was made before he passed away. But they changed the laws around that to, to make it so that they weren't allowed to have toys that had um, tobacco advertising or tobacco livery on them. So there was only ever about 320 of these made from what I understand. So it cost me quite a lot of money, but this is something that I've had on my desk now for seven years, every day. I always had it on my desk at work. I've always had it on my desk here at home as well since I've been working from home something that is very, very, very significant to me. I've also got a couple of newspapers that you can see here from the days immediately after he passed away. Now, I, you know, I haven't read these for, for years now, but I just like to have them because, you know, it, it, it helps me to remember, you know, such a, such a significant time in history. I mean, just looking at these now, you know, Crash Kills, Grand Prix Superstar, Grand Prix Star, front page of the Herald Sun, you know, and it's got Death of a Legend, pages 84 to 85. And, you know, Grand Prix Racing was in shock today after the death of a champion driver, Etten Senna, at, in a 300 kilometer an hour crash in Italy. And then we go on to the back, Senna's Fear. Senna was the greatest driver ever, 
when somebody like him is killed, you have to ask yourself, what's the point of it all? And that was said by Nicky Lauda, who is obviously one of the greats of the sport as well. Then we go on to, that was May 2nd, so the day after. Um, the, the accident actually occurred in the evening, our time in, in Australia. So we, we didn't find out, unless we were watching live, we didn't actually find out about it until the next morning when we woke up. And I rem- I'll never forget, I, um, I didn't actually watch, I watched the qualifying live, I didn't watch the race live, I was in bed. And I remember I, I, I woke up the next morning, got, started getting ready for school. And my, I, went out to the, I went out to the living room to get my breakfast. And I can remember it like it was yesterday. I went out to the living room. My mum was just sitting there in tears. And I'm like, what's going on? And um, she just said to me that Ayrton Senna had died. And I just, I just lost it. I just burst into tears. I was like, what? And, you know, I, I, I was aware that Roland Ratzenberger had died the day before. But... You know, this was my hero and he was just gone. And yeah, it really, you know, as a nine-year-old kid, that was huge. You know, I'd never, I'd never dealt with the loss of a family member. I've been lucky that, you know, I'd never lost a close grandparent or a parent or anything like that. And, you know, this was my hero it was just dead. And like, I'm tearing up now just talking about it, but like, I was just in absolute shock. And, you know, I, I, I remember I, I did go to school, I, I, but I was just a zombie for the whole day. And I got home and I was still in tears and my mum was still in tears. And, um, yeah, it was just massive. And, I mean, this was back when, you know, I wasn't doing go-karting or anything. I wasn't even really involved in, um, in motor racing. I was, I was racing motorbikes back then. I, I was in a motocross club. But, um, yeah, it was just, you know, I, I'd grown up watching this guy and he was just gone. And, you know, so those are, those are the, like, I'm tearing up thinking about it 25 years later, but this is, you know, this is the significance of what this is to me. But, um, you know, so as a, as a young child, you know, he was my hero because of what he represented, because he was the fastest and the best and the most dedicated and all those things. And as I've, um, as I've grown up, I, um, you know, there are a lot of years there where I didn't really think about it, you know, in, in my early teenage years, wasn't a really significant event for me anywhere. I kind of, I kind of dropped out of, you know, the whole Formula One scene. I wasn't really interested in the sport anymore after Senna died. It just didn't seem the same. I mean, I was familiar with what was going on in terms of Michael Schumacher absolutely dominating. You know, Damon Hill was doing okay as well. And just thinking, you know, these guys would be nothing if it wasn't for the death of Ed and Senna. You know, Ed and Senna would be absolutely dominating. And you know, I always kind of wondered what would have happened if he'd if he'd lived. You know, would would he still be winning races 10 years later or, you know, what would be going on. And um, so I just kind of lost interest in the sport at that point for a long time. And it wasn't until I, um, I, I think when I, when I finished school and I got my first job that, um, you know, I was, I was unemployed for a little while there after school, you know, when I was looking for my first job. And I can't remember exactly what triggered it. It might have been things in the news at the time about, the, the Senna trial and things like that. And also, we you know, by then we had the internet as well. So we were able to do our own research and stuff. And I became, I think at, at the age of about 18, I became absolutely obsessed with wanting to understand exactly what happened. I had to know what caused the accident. I had to know why. I had to know who was responsible. And it became this, I'd say it was almost an unhealthy obsession. I, I, I hired every single book that I could from the library about about Ayrton Senna, I, you know, bought everything, every single bit of memorabilia that I could afford in relation to Ayrton Senna. I, you know, I wasn't, I didn't buy this until later on, but, um, you know, I became absolutely obsessed and I didn't really have much else to do while I was looking for a job, but I spent months just studying all of this and watching all the videos over and over and over again, reading all the reports, everything. And I, it, I didn't really understand why. I just, I was just obsessed with it. And then one day it finally kind of dawned on me. I was right in the midst of trying to get my first job out of school. And I was, I was having a lot of problems with depression and anxiety, things like that. And, you know, really not having a whole lot of self-worth about myself, feeling like I was, you know, just this kid that, you know, was promised the world all through school, always thought that I was going to amount to something amazing. And then was faced with the reality of the real world and, um, you know, having to find a job and, you know, I'm also, you know, I'm a severe anxiety sufferer. I also have Asperger's syndrome as well. So that's something that is always a little bit of a struggle for me as well. But um, I, I was faced with a situation of having to, you know, go out into the real world. And, 
you know, with all this Ant and Senna stuff still on my mind, I really started to reflect on just his his character in terms of his absolute pure dedication and, you know, the the way that he was just relentlessly focused on what it was that he was trying to achieve, which was to be the best that he could be. It wasn't about... I mean, obviously, winning winning races and winning championships was a massive part of that, but he wanted to be the best person that he could be, the best representation of himself and what he believed in. And I think that was what made him absolutely great. And if you've seen the Top Gear segment that Jeremy Clarkson did about Senna many, many years ago now, he, he touched on this as well, the fact that he wasn't really a Senna fan in terms of his racing and stuff like that. He thought that he was a bit of an arrogant driver and not a very nice person, but when he went back through and watched those hours and hours and hours of footage, it dawned on him that every single time Senna got in the car, he was exceptional, and that he gave it his absolute everything every single time he was behind the wheel of the car. And I kind of, in, in the situation that I was in, you know, trying to find a job, I drew, I guess, comfort in that, in that, you know, he could still kind of be my hero, even though he hadn't been around for, at that point, almost 10 years. This was 2003, so it had been nine years since he'd passed away. And I kind of, you know, I looked back on my childhood and my, my heroes and my motivation throughout my childhood, and I, I, kind, I kind of came back to that feeling of, you know, if, if, if Ed and Senna could do that, why couldn't I? Why couldn't I strive to be the best human being that I could be? Why couldn't I, I guess, you know, do do the things that I needed to do to be proud of myself? And, you know, I, I, I wanted to be able to go home at the end of every day, regardless of what it was that I'd been doing that day, and feel like I'd done the best that I could possibly do. And whether that was, you know, with my family, at home... You know, at the time I was still living with my parents, but or living with my mum at least. But I wanted to be the best person that I could be, and it was and like it sounds it sounds silly, but you know, Ed and Senna was the person that made me want to be that person. It's like it's funny reflecting on it now, but it sounds it sounds crazy, but that's genuinely true. And so when I when I started at work, you know, I, I was working every day. I was very very blessed to have an amazing job straight out of school. I was working. For a company that was contracted to the military, doing um, doing circuit design and development and things like that for military applications. So I had, you know, security clearance and things like that. It was an absolutely incredible job, and you know, I always kind of attributed that to the fact that I had such a drive and such motivation from you know from from this whole from all this stuff and. You know, even going on and doing things like this YouTube channel as well, it's still been, you know, motivation that I've drawn from that feeling of wanting to be the best that I can possibly be and, you know, provide for my family, provide for my kids that I have now, my wife that I have now. You know, life goes on and, you know, adult responsibility kicks in. But, you know, you always kind of, you go back to those things that shaped your childhood and shaped you to become the person that you are. And Ayrton Senna is a massive part of that for me. So that's, I guess part of the reason, well, the main, the main reason why I'm such a massive Ed and Senna fan. So I think I'm going to leave it at that for this video for now. If you guys would like to know more about my personal journey and, you know, the things that I've been up to and what's kind of led me to this point and doing the YouTube channel and the jobs that I do and things like that, because I don't really, I don't really get too personal with this channel very often. I've done a couple of videos about depression and anxiety in the past, I've done an article for Cars for Hope in the past as well, which I'll link in the description as well. But, you know, this is something that's very significant to me. And I've mentioned before in the videos that I started this channel because I wanted to test myself and push myself outside of my comfort zones and really, I guess, share the knowledge that I gained through my own research and, you know, the experiments and, you know, projects that I do with you guys. And I, I, I accept and acknowledge that I'm extremely blessed to be in a financial position. And I mean, you know, it's been through my own success you know through my own effort like it's not like I've been born with a silver spoon in my mouth or anything like that but you know I have had success with my jobs and you know I earn enough money that I can pay for projects and toys and things like that and I want to I genuinely want to share that with you guys and um, so if, if, if you are interested in knowing more about that kind of stuff and my own personal journey let me know in the let me know in the comments reach out on the discord channel have a chat with me I'm always happy to chat with you guys and help you guys out if, you know, I really would love for you guys to draw a little bit of inspiration from this as well in your own personal journeys, because I know that day-to-day -day life can be a real struggle. And, 
it is really easy to get bogged down in stuff. And, you know, for me, it's my motivation comes from, you know, remembering my, my childhood heroes and things like that. And, you know, wanting to be the best person that I can be for my family and, you know, for those around me. So I, I'm starting to ramble a little bit here, but I really do hope that you guys can draw some inspiration from that. I'm going to wrap it up here for now. Let me know in the comments below if you guys want to know more about that. But look, guys, that is, that is why Etten Center is such a massively significant figure to me. So on this day, 25 years later, you know, it's, it's hard to believe that it was 25 years ago. And I'm, you know, I've been sitting here today at work reflecting on, you know, the, the emotions that I experienced on that day when I found out that he'd passed away, you know, seeing my mum in tears, all that sort of stuff. And it's, it's a difficult day. It's, um, you know, it's a difficult day for me. It sounds silly. I'm just some guy in Australia. You know, I've never, I've never been to Imola. I've never been out, had the opportunity to visit the track or anything like that. But, um, I really would encourage you guys to, you know, check out the, some of the videos that I've linked in the description below. There's a lot of really good stuff out there that really offers a lot of valuable insight. But as I said, look, guys, please do let me know in the comments below if you'd like to know more about this stuff. I generally do tend to keep personal stuff off the channel, but, um, it's an emotional day for me and I just wanted to share this with you guys. So hopefully you've found it interesting and useful. That's it for today's video. I'll see you guys again soon. Bye.